Show with your host, Lonnie Clark. We stand together and accept that we now live in a world transformed by Fukushima. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on UCY.TV Radio. We relentlessly engage every ear that listens. We expose and confront the complete lack of accountability for the nuclear industry. Consider social engineering programs to view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. The Age of Vision radio show creates a venue that all will choose. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action and save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Our actions matter. Every voice matters. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Vision radio show. Uh, I am really excited to be with you this morning. Um, you know, normally on Mondays I interview people, or I've been attempting to interview people from St. Louis. This past week I had an opportunity to uh, speak with Carl Grossman. I reached out to him for an interview and he said yes, and he said, can we do it Monday? And I said yes. So here we are. Uh, let me give you some backstory about Mr. Carl Grossman. I actually have been following him for years. He is an investigative reporter, and he is also a pro professor at the State University of New York College of Old Westbury. And he's, it really courses in investigative reporting. And uh, I heard him on the radio with Dr. Helen Caldicott three and a half years ago. And he, we, they were talking about Fukushima, and he basically said, we need everybody to get involved. We need you to stop telling yourselves you can't do it. Please do get active. And I took that seriously, and I have been active ever since. So, uh, Carl, thank you. Thank you for joining me on the radio today. It's really my honor and pleasure. It's my honor and pleasure uh, to be on with you, Lonnie. Well, it's really great. Look. I want to jump right into this interview. We only have an hour, but, you know, right now in our country, uh, we are suffering quite a bit of pain, and I think we're waking up from the realization that journalism is a necessary part of the picture in our country. And what has been lacking, especially in the nuclear industry, is a complete lack of interest in investigating what people are being fed. Um, what do you tell your students and what do you tell people about the necessity of questioning the documents they're given and the information that they're given? Yeah, well, um, journalism, uh, particularly um, investigative reporting, uh, critical to, uh, to a free society, to a democratic society. I think when it comes to nuclear power, what we've seen is a... Uh, well, I've, I've written about this extensively, a real breakdown in terms of press function. My first book on nuclear power, it's entitled Cover Up, What You're Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power. Well, just let me read the, uh, the beginning, the introduction, the first few sentences. Please do. It's you great. have not been informed about nuclear power. You have not been told, and that has been done on purpose. Keeping the public in the dark was deemed necessary by the promoters of nuclear power if it was to succeed. Those in government, science, and private industry who have been pushing nuclear power realize that if people were given the facts, if they knew the consequences of nuclear power, they wouldn't stand for it. And it goes on and on and on. Uh, as to a, That is a great book that you wrote, by the way. And there is a free download on your website, Carl Gross. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, just go to... Uh, 
www.carl with a K Grossman, one word, dot com, and just hit on the uh, little button, click on the button for books, and uh, well, as a result of the generosity of the publisher, there's a free download of the latest edition of Cover Up What You're Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power. And in the book, I, I, I did it, uh, well, it was published in 1980. And I did it uh, after the Three Mile Island accident. Uh, what I do is, uh, in the book, publish or reprint as facsimiles many of the important documents in regards to nuclear power. The stuff you don't, well, you don't hear about uh, on mainstream mass media, radio, or read about in uh, the mainstream print press or. Uh, Oh, certainly on television, you you don't get much information along these lines. I mean, thank heavens, in recent times for the internet and and programs like like yours, that people are getting some information. But still, well, just to jump to the chase, consider Fukushima, five years now of a a solid, an absolutely solid cover up. In any case, the book cover up what you're not supposed to know about nuclear power includes. Many important documents that you again don't hear, read, or or see. For example, way back in the in the 1960s, Brookhaven National Laboratory. It's one of the national nuclear laboratories in the United States. It was set up by the Atomic Energy Commission in 1947. Here, where I live in Long Island, to basically develop civilian uses of nuclear technology, also to do atomic research, but. Mainly, they were looking for a, a new national laboratory in addition to Los Alamos and Oak Ridge, Argonne, and so forth, that would focus on nuclear power plants and food irradiation and all kinds of civilian things, commercial things, could be done with nuclear power. Well, Brookhaven Lab did a study on the consequences of catastrophic accidents at nuclear power plants way back in the 1960s called WASH 740 Update, and page after page in cover-up is devoted to WASH 740 Update, where I actually reprint sections of the report, including uh, one important line. In fact, this is repeated over and over again in WASH 740 Update, and I'll read it. The possible the size of the area of such a disaster might be equal to that of the state of Pennsylvania. And this was done a decade before Three Mile Island, the Three Mile Island nuclear plant in Pennsylvania, almost uh, had a catastrophe enveloping an area the size of the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, again, uh, this kind of information is is, is 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 not known by the public in general. Though, so let me note uh, in the in the movie China Syndrome, which came out a few weeks after the TMI accident in 79, there is a line about, oh, uh, uh, a big accident could devastate an area the size of the state of Pennsylvania. But that line was written in Hollywood. It was written at Brookhaven National Laboratory, an Atomic Energy Commission laboratory uh, way back then. Now it's run by the Department of Energy. And th those are the stakes. The, the, those are the issues involved. We're talking here about... Uh, when you talk about nuclear power, uh, a, a catastrophe, a disaster, far beyond anything else. Uh, well, take a chemical disaster. Bhopal is uh, the worst so far, and you're talking about nearly 2,000 people dead. Uh, terrible tragedy uh, in that factory uh, in, in Bhopal, India. But with nuclear power, the scale of destruction is, is so much more enormous as we're witnessing that we're not being informed uh, with the the ongoing the continuing catastrophe involving the uh, uh, the Fuka, the six Fukushima nuclear power plants uh, in Japan. Well, you know, in your book, uh, in your introduction, you actually say that part of the. It, you're exposing it. It, it. I'm just going to read it. It says, in this new edition, I describe ways the promoters of nuclear power have tried to deceive us. That is so true. That's what I've discovered. I'm excessively new to this, uh, quote, anti-nuke movement, and I don't actually call myself 
I guess I am an anti-nuker now because I think it's one of the worst experiments we've ever had. But for me, it's about why do we need why what the, the the issue the thing that really destroyed our began to eat away at our democracy and the truth and our environment was the secrecy like you said this was a secret lab over the weekend i met with some people that uh, a woman who actually grew up in hanford near hanford and her father was deemed insane when he started complaining and and you know he worked at hanford and she was a little mm -hmm. girl she used to get to go there and there, she was taught as a child, you do not talk about this. You don't. Nobody out there talks about it. The secrecy level is just off the charts. And if you question it, it has to be unquestionably, uh, it, it's excessively unquestionable. And this is the issue, I think, Carl, for us in our country right now. Like, like you said earlier, thank goodness for the internet because we're breaking the silence. Um, Dr. John Goffman in the book uh, Poison Power that I read, I re actually read that book online, actually. I read two of his books uh, online when I start in the last co course of the last year or so. I read uh, a book I thought was a joke. It was called uh, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution. In oh, that yes. book, he stated that basically his investigation showed that um, the nuclear industry, the IAEA, the military, U.S. military, and the government deny that radiation causes harm and regularly underreport the negative effects by 90%. So I call that the 90% rule. <laughs> We're still living the 90%. <laughs> and, and that continues. And for listeners who aren't familiar with Dr. John Goffman, I mean, he, he's, he's a giant in uh, the, the area of nuclear physics. He in fact, uh, for the Manhattan Project, the crash program to develop atomic weapons during the war, uh, was uh, an early uh, did early experiments with plutonium. Uh, he co-discovered a number of radioisotopes. Uh, he was associate director at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. It's one of these national nuclear laboratories, uh, and he was longtime professor at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he understood very early uh, the the terrible, terrible dangers of uh, of nuclear power, and he Poison Power is a, is a classic book. It's uh, I would really urge uh, readers to go to it. It's it's such an important book, and he was one of these rare people who broke from the nuclear establishment. Uh, that's what it's been called. Sometimes it's called the Atomic Brotherhood, uh, and stood up uh, at great cost. I mean, they went after him, uh, and he spoke the truth about nuclear power. Another person who also, but way, way at the end of his career, who spoke the truth, and, and this is an important concept to understand when you're talking about atomic energy, nuclear power, was Admiral Hyman Rickover, the so-called father of the, of the U.S. nuclear navy, and actually he was in charge of the construction of the first nuclear plant built in the United States shipping port near Pittsburgh. And so he was a great promoter of for many years nuclear power, but he too finally saw the light and indeed uh, in cover up what you're not supposed to know about nuclear power, I spend two pages, well, summarizing and quoting from the farewell address given by uh, Admiral Rickover to a committee of Congress when he retired from the Navy. And in that address, what he says is that a few billion years ago, there was so much radioactivity on Earth that life couldn't exist. But when these, these radioactive substances went through their, their half-lives, their hazardous lifetimes, and cooled out, then life could begin. And then he goes on, again, this is Admiral Rickover, not Greenpeace. He goes on to say that by building and operating these nuclear power plants, these nuclear, nuclear reactors, we are recreating the very poisons which precluded life from existing on Earth. And then he goes on, there I think the human race is going to wreck itself. Thus we must outlaw, that's the word he uses, outlaw nuclear reactors because of the poisons, the strontium-90 and the cesium-137 and the iodine-131 and all these terrible, terrible poisons, uh, some of which last... Uh, 
thousands, in fact, some millions of years produced by, uh, by nuclear reactors. And that's the, the so-called bottom line here, uh, that nuclear power represents a, an enormous threat to life on Earth. And furthermore, it is totally unnecessary. Maybe I can just give a little history as to how we got on this dead-end road. And it involved, very much involves the Manhattan Project. I mean, no one through the many years uh, I've functioned as a journalist has ever called me a, a conservative politically. And I'm not a conservative or anything. Politically, I'm an independent. But I'm certainly no conservative. But when conservatives talk about uh, government setting up an office and attempting to perpetuate what that office does, uh, they're actually quite correct. And a, a case in point is the Manhattan Project. What occurred was there was this crash program that began during World War II, or actually began just before World War II. Uh, it, it was precipitated by fission. The splitting of the atom was done in Berlin, in Germany, in December of 1938. And a number of scientists who were refugees from the, the Nazis uh, realized what Hitler and the Nazis could do with fission. And uh, they had Albert Einstein, one of these refugees, uh, write a letter to President Franklin D. Roosevelt, essentially urging we fight fire with fire. We develop nuclear weapons before the Nazis do it. And that gives birth to the Manhattan Project, in which uh, at least 125,000 people were employed. I've seen estimates of even more than that. Billions of dollars were spent, and the Manhattan Project came up with, uh, with atomic weaponry. Uh, and uh, in the wake of the, the Manhattan Project, the push continued to build more atomic bombs and under Edward Teller, the super, the hydrogen bomb. But the, the issue there among the the folks who were involved in the Manhattan Project is what else could we do to perpetuate this undertaking? Uh, and, uh, I mean, you couldn't sell an atomic bomb to uh, even an ally, even to England or France. Atomic bombs don't lend themselves to commercial spinoff. So what they began to consider were various things that can be done with atomic energy, which would really perpetuate this, this huge... Um, these laboratories, the bureaucracy, and also uh, to take uh, the perspective of the left here, uh, which views uh, big business as being the culprit for many a terrible thing uh, in this world. Uh, two corporations that were involved up to their neck in the Manhattan Project were Westinghouse and GE. They were principal contractors, so they wanted to see their contracts continue. So after the war, 46, 47, 48, the Manhattan Project in 46 becomes the Atomic Energy Commission. There was this headlong push to uh, develop civilian uses, commercial uses of nuclear technology. And you mentioned Hanford before, and that's very important because that was also one of the Manhattan Project facilities. What they did at Hanford was to set up reactors, nuclear reactors, specifically to produce plutonium for nuclear weapons. Uh, the Nagasaki secret, bomb Carl. was fueled with, yep. Very secret. With, with, yeah, was fueled with plutonium. And in the process of producing plutonium, those Hanford nuclear reactors generated a lot of heat. So out of that came this really the crazy idea of using fission, using atomic energy, to boil water to turn a turbine to generate electricity, certainly the most dangerous way ever conceived to boil water. So that's really what gave birth to all this, uh, an, a, an attempt to perpetuate a vested interest that was created during World War II with the Manhattan Project and to promote uh, uh, nuclear technology in all kinds of ways. As to the people involved in it, you mentioned uh, not speaking about what occurred at Hanford. Uh, what I have found, whether it's at Brookhaven National Laboratory or now Idaho National Laboratory or Los Alamos, uh, there's been a, a nuclear cult that has developed. I mean, I, I've done a lot of work through the years on 
uh, chemical pollution. I did a book uh, on, on toxic chemicals. Uh, and in the book, in fact, that book, I interview, uh, this is at the request of the publisher, he said, why don't you find somebody from a, a chemical company to get their, uh, their justification? And I found somebody who worked for American Cyanamid in New Jersey, and I asked, why, why did you do it? And he said, well, I had four kids. I had to make money and so forth and so on. When you get to nuclear, it's a different thing. It becomes almost semi-religious. Indeed, right. at, at these, na these national laboratories, I've heard these scientists describe themselves as nukies, sort of like moonies. And what they're, uh, and I don't know exactly why. The nuclear priesthood, Carl. That, that it, Dr. It, it's, Weinberg, it's, did you ever read that uh, speech? I, I've actually read it on my, I found a research paper. You know, I'm a student in college, and I was researching right. for a science class, and I found a paper by Dr. Alvin Weinberg, very pro yes. guy, gave a speech in 1972 in Boulder, Colorado, in which he called themselves for the first time the nuclear priesthood. He said, we have entered oh, yeah. into a Faustian agreement with humanity that now we've created this substance that we have to look to the nuclear priesthood to protect all of humanity for time and for, for in, into infinity. And I'm like, boy, when I read that article, I was like, you guys have certainly failed 100%. Like, Yeah, and Alvin Weinberg, background here, he was for long, many years the director of Oak Ridge oh, National wow. Laboratory. And and indeed, in in, in cover up, uh, I I I went to a uh, a speech by Dr. Weinberg at a Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island, wow. where in fact he 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 talked about the same thing that you're talking about. In fact, Weinberg disagreed with the uh, design of the reactors that uh, were being built. This is 20 years ago; it's still being built. Uh, which are f fueled with uranium, uh, enriched uranium, uh, he felt it would be better to do plutonium. Uh, again, going back to Hanford, <laughs> what occurs when you have fission is that the uranium-238 atom grabs a neutron and it, tr it transforms itself to plutonium-239. And plutonium-239 then can be used in a bomb or it could be used in a, a nuclear plant. They call them breeder reactors. Breeder because you start off in a breeder reactor with a lot of uranium-238, and you you blanket that with plutonium-239. You get the 239 to, uh, uh, to fission, and it causes that U-238 to pick up neutrons and it to become plutonium-239. So the idea is you end up with more nuclear fuel than what you started. You're breeding more nuclear fuel. The problem, and and Weinberg, he understood, is that plutonium is so toxic. I mean, of all the radioactive substances, plutonium has been described as the most lethal. A millionth of, the, of a gram in one's lung will give a person lung cancer, like all the time. Uh, indeed, after the Manhattan Project, because there were accidents in the Manhattan Project involving plutonium. They did, this is the Atomic Energy Commission, did the famous beagle dog tests where they caused little beagle dogs to inhale a microscopic amount of plutonium. That doctor 100% is still of doing that. Dr. Gilmedy is still testing dogs to find out how low of a dose. Uh, they're all dying still to this day. Well, 100% of the time, they died of this plutonium. So in any case, Weinberg understood you know, the, the, the lethality of plutonium and to fuel a society, to fuel a world with plutonium, obviously dangerous. But, he says in his speech that I, I sat, and in fact I taped, if there was any doubt about as to what he said, we, the atomic priesthood, and I remember him looking out into the audience at Brookhaven National Laboratory, and there was hundreds of these scientists s s smiling as he spoke. Uh, we, the atomic priesthood, could uh, essentially be stewards of this uh, plutonium fuel society. I mean, th th this is uh, talking about Helen Caldicott. You opened noting Dr. Helen Caldicott, a, 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 yes. such an important figure in the fight against nuclear power, and also in my book, Cover Up What You're Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power, which again, people can get for free online. Awesome. Just it's go to my book. It's 326 pages, and frankly, 
It provides so much complete, really great information. Everybody should download it. Buy a copy of it. If you can afford to buy a copy, buy a copy of it. But, you well, know, it, it is the, really the awesome. Newest edition, uh, the newest edition, uh, just, just, just let me add to that. The newest edition has a new introduction by me. And after the Fukushima accident, this goes back to what you're talking about in regards to media and the press. After the Fukushima accident, the publisher said, let's put out a new edition. And the publisher tried to get various other major publishers to put one out, but couldn't. So as a result, what the publisher did uh, was just to say, let's, we're just going to put the book online, this new edition with your new introduction and people can download it for free uh and uh, wow. uh you know uh uh you're telling me that you can't find anybody to reproduce this product after fukushima well it's it's the the wake of fukushima the cover-up has been it's Ask. one of the biggest co cover-ups i think and in global history. Just to go back to Helen, uh, I quote her, this is during a protest uh, up in New Hampshire, uh, uh, an anti-nuclear protest. Uh, she said, we're at the cross, we're in the hands of lunatics at the crossroads of time. And uh, this is this is the situation. Uh, and, and, and as to how you started this program, the fact that people are not informed, uh, that's key to this thing because, as I note in the beginning of cover-up, if people knew that these machines are so dangerous, uh, they really threaten life on Earth. And moreover, there's no need for them other than to f provide work for some of these scientists and engineers at the National that. Laboratory. It's stunning. There's, I mean, when... We're talking about those three decre those uh, two decrepit nuclear power plants closing down in Illinois, right? And do you know that yes. the National Resource Defense Fund in Illinois, their arm is actually working with the state legislature in Illinois to keep those plants open so they can close down some coal plants. And I, uh, ha yeah, I, I actually, co I told the guy I really want to challenge him on that. I'm hoping we can interview on it because. The position of the establishment uh, uh, environmentalists, in quotes, is that coal, like green, green, Greenpeace even believe, you know, like they're anti-nuclear. Same thing in National Resource Defense Fund. They say they're anti-nuclear, but they believe that global warming and fossil fuel production is more of a threat than nuclear. Instead of realizing that they are the same, because Nuclear uses a, a massive amounts of fossil fuel, and nuclear it really produces tremendous amounts of waste and product. You ca you cannot separate the fossil fuel and the coal industry. It, you know, in my view, the mining practices of uranium. It's it, there. None of it is disconnected. They're not, it's kind of like asking which is like you said earlier, which is worse cholera or cancer they're all you're gonna die yeah and, and and when somebody tries to because these days is this this push again to revive nuclear power when you hear somebody say uh nuclear plants don't produce uh greenhouse gases what they're not saying is that the nuclear fuel cycle the mining and the milling and right. the uh, the enrichment Storage. and the fabrication you know, or it is 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 a is a tremendous contributor of greenhouse gases, uh, uh, a culprit in terms of uh, of global warming. Uh, so, you know, n nuclear power is not green or clean. As to some of the groups, now l l let me say there are some wonderful organizations that people, listeners, can get involved with. I'm on the board, for example, of Beyond Nuclear. Uh, it's based uh, in Tacoma Park, Washington, near Washington D.C. Just go to beyondnuclear.org, a terrific organization. Right, Greenpeace. Yeah, Greenpeace is obviously a, a great organization. The Nuclear Information and Resource Service, NEARS, a great organization. Well, I, have the to, radio I have to challenge you about I really am angry about Greenpeace staying silent about Fukushima over the last five years. I, uh, this is partly why I'm on the radio three times a week, even though I run my yeah. own business and go to school. 
because the establishment anti nukers are being, in my view, bought out by the nuclear industry. Yeah, well, I'm just I, 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 I don't I don't disagree with you, Lonnie, in terms of some groups, but you got to know some history here too. Uh, the Environmental Defense Fund, for example, which is very concerned about global warming, but is not concerned about nuclear. Let me just give you a couple of minute history on EDF. Environmental Defense Fund was founded here on Long Island back in the 1960s, and it had among its uh, well original uh, founders a number of folks from Brookhaven National Laboratory. They lived in a community called Bellport, in which there was a massive spraying with DDT of mosquitoes. And quite rightly, uh, some of these scientists felt that DDT was terrible and is right. and was terrible. And uh, they formed a committee and they hired an attorney, Victor Yannicone, and they fought uh, the wanton spraying of mosquitoes with DDT by the Suffolk County Mosquito Control Commission. Out of that fight, and in fact, that committee and those folks, and Vic Yannicone, along a very even more important Rachel Carson, because it all happened the same time in the early 60s. Silent Spring was published in 62. <laughs> the result was DDT was, was outlawed. Meanwhile, that committee morphed into what became the Environmental Defense Fund, which for many years had its national headquarters here on Long Island, uh, in Setauket on Long Island. Now the national headquarters are in New York and Washington. So uh, EDF has been good on toxic chemicals, right. but because of the nature of its founding, not very good on nuclear. Or if we could just jump for a second in terms of other entities that and how they do it that have been promoting uh, uh, well nuclear power uh, I mentioned earlier Westinghouse and General Electric two major contractors during the Manhattan Project uh, well guess who owned CBS the CBS network for many years Westinghouse right. uh, guess who owned NBC for many many years right. General Electric in fact historically Westinghouse and General Electric were the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power worldwide. Eighty percent of nuclear plants worldwide historically are of Westinghouse and or GE manufacture and or design. Now, something that happened in 2009, you don't read about, probably most listeners aren't aware, but very important in terms of what happened a number of years later when it came to Fukushima and that is a company called Hitachi acquired GE's nuclear operation. Well, actually went into partnership with GE in its nuclear operation, but now it's Hitachi GE. And a company called Westinghouse, a, a company called, uh, I'm sorry, it isn't Westinghouse, Toshiba acquired Westinghouse. So now the, the Coke and Pepsi, of nuclear power are both Japanese brands, basically. And in terms of the um, the cover-up, and it's an enormous cover-up uh, involving all kind of government agencies on the international level, the in International Atomic Energy Agency, the World Health Organization here in this country, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy, all would like to cover up Fukushima, say, no one is going to die as a result of Fukushima. No one has died as a result of Fukushima. I mean, outright lies. Uh, there's a nuclear Pinocchio. In addition, you have the Japanese government, particularly with the current prime minister, Abe, absolutely lying, lying through their teeth about the consequences, the impacts going on right now right. Of, of Fukushima. And part of that is connected to these two now – uh, major brands when it comes to nuclear power uh, being Japanese brands, in addition to the, the utility that owns the Fukushima operation, TEPCO and so forth. So uh, there's all kind of connections and there's uh, all kind of linkages. And in fighting nuclear power, and it's so important that uh, listeners commit themselves to fighting nuclear power. I mean, years ago, 
the notion was um, uh, active today or radioactive tomorrow. Well, that still stands other than we are becoming more radioactive today. Uh, you got to fight. you got to get involved with Beyond Nuclear and Nuclear Information and Resource Service and other groups in fighting Friends of the Earth, the good groups in fighting nuclear power. And again, my view is that Greenpeace basically has has been okay. I mean, the, the effort now has been, I mean, and this sounds crazy, to normalize nuclear yes. radiation, the EPA is about radioactive the pollution. Standards. I mean, you, you realize that the EPA is about to raise the radiation standards. If we have a nuclear emergency, they're just going to raise the standards. I, by iodine 131 by 3,000, over 3,000%. 3, yes. And, you it's, know, it's, and, and, and in terms of drinking water, uh, the, the, the push right now to change the standards in terms of allowable radioactivity in drinking water, I mean, absolutely. Absolutely so, Paul, enormous. Let me, let me just out challenge you on this. I don't mean to challenge you, but honestly, I I have been spitting nails over these establishment uh, environmentalists that you say are, you think they're do. I actually think they are doing a horrendous job of these standards are being raised. Are they? Frankly, look. Uh, let me just get to the big ones that are the big offenders in my view. National Resource Defense Council. Their mission statement is to safeguard the earth, its people, its plants and animals, and the natural systems on which all life depends. They brought in, in 2013, because they did not post illegally their 14990 return, 121 seventeen thousand dollars They have said... Yeah, I, I'm have not, not gonna, I have not heard... But, Ronnie, I'm not going to argue with you about NRDC and nuclear. I just Nor don't will get I. Why, who, could you, uh, you're, be, you're, you're near these people. You've been engaged with them. I'm sure you know many yeah. of them. How is it that we have five years of Fukushima raging? We've had WIP. We have had uh, Fukushima happen. We have Sellafield. World, we have really serious environmental attacks. We have St. Louis. St. Louis people are living next to a dump site that is next to nuclear fuel that's on fire and people are literally dying and this is yeah, I well, just, which comes which goes back again history is so important that that nuclear material that was buried yes Manhattan is some of the Project earliest Earth. nuclear material produced in the Manhattan project right. and it was just left there by these people who well i mean the, the extreme of all this is uh, what's called hormesis and I think listeners should understand what that's about. You can Google it. Nuclear or radioactive hormesis, H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S. -S. Yes, and that's a theory that some of these nukies, some of these nuclear scientists have concocted, that not only is, is, is radiation not bad for you, but it's good for you. And they call it hormesis. They claim it exercises the immune system. So... Getting back to this issue of water, the EPA, the, our Environmental Protection Agency, is proposing now a thousand-fold increase, 1,000-fold increase in radioactivity allowed in drinking water. And some of these organizations that I'm involved with, uh, Beyond Nuclear, the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, uh, are in the forefront in fighting this. But... The, the well, isn't the backstory? It's it's central to this so-called normalization of radioactivity. In other words, telling people, well, there's background radiation. Uh, nuclear technology right. just adds a little bit to the background right. we have radon, radiation. A lot more radon coming from the sun. Natural radon is. We have radiation well, all the time. Yeah, but they, what what they won't say about background radiation is that so much of cancer and other diseases are caused by the background radiation, which we can't do very much about. By adding to background radiation, right. what we're doing is, is oh, uh, Dr. John Goffman, who was both a PhD and an MD, a medical doctor, right. said decades ago, we are indeed causing uh, a pretty dastardly form of, of population uh, control or, or or reduction, uh, but these people are so into their 
it's sort of like uh, the extreme, an extreme version, or a, 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 how can I put this, a, uh, an expanded version of the tobacco industry decades ago, which yeah. would claim that not only tobacco didn't cause cancer, but lots of doctors, in fact, they used to advertise this, that doctors prefer camels and, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, these people, uh, they should be, in my view, judged yeah. on, on the principles of Nuremberg. Uh, we're talking about crimes against, against humanity. And just, just to jump forward, if I could, as with smoking, nuclear technology is absolutely, nuclear power, absolutely unnecessary. When I wrote Cover Up What You're Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power, the chapters that I have in there, uh, there's a chapter I have in there in alternatives, and I talk about solar and wind and so forth. And back in when I wrote the book in 79, some of that stuff was, well, somewhat theoretical when it came to solar and wind technology. But now, in 2016, solar and wind technology, it's here, it's it's totally economic, it's 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 energy we can live with and it's available to be put online and to uh, to energize our societies for us to have societies energized a hundred percent renewable and it's just not just solar and wind there's tidal power and wind power I mean, you, you can go down the list of all the many safe clean green forms of energy that are here today available uh, you know that that uh, years ago, the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, uh, some of its scientists put a book about renewables, put out a book, Renewables Are Ready. These days, renewables are more than ready. So there's, we need to, in my view, shut down every nuclear plant in the United States and every nuclear plant around the world. There's 438 operating nuclear plants worldwide today. And all, in my view, should be shut down uh, these nukies, these nuclear scientists will have jobs forever because the nuclear waste that has been generated, these poisons that preclude life from existing, that stuff is going to have to be somehow yeah. isolated from life, uh, separated from life for uh, beyond centuries, beyond millennia. Uh, what has been done now is, 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 is a curse to this planet, to the ecology, to life on this planet, and uh, it's going to have to be dealt with uh, into eternity. Meanwhile, no more nuclear poisons should be generated. Uh, and uh, just a note in terms of catastrophic accidents, I mean, we've had Three Mile Island, we've had Chernobyl, uh, uh, there's work, in fact, it's noted in the new edition of uh, Cover Up, uh, cover up uh, analysis cover up. of the Carl, I, I don't mean but, to interrupt you, but when you talk about issues of uh, contamination and problems, ev there have been more cover-ups. The Santa Susana was covered up. I mean, absolutely. There is. Absolutely. I just heard about a cover-up, the Green Run, where they in intentionally allowed the radiation to go. I mean, that's all the nuclear industry has done is lie, 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 and cover up. Oh, okay. And, and and these aren't really accidents. So many of them, they're like where I I am in New, the New York area, Long Island's in the New York area, and they talk about um, uh, tritium getting out of the Indian Point nuclear plants, which is radioactive water, H three O. It can't be separated from from real water once it's out, and it's gotten into the underground water in that area of upstate New York and into the Hudson River, which flows down to New York City. Can't be filtered out. Uh, it's been discharged on purpose. It's been released on purpose. These people back at Brookhaven National Laboratory, back to that place where the two operating reactors were closed a number of years ago as a result of strong public opposition here in Long Island, the scientists argued, well, what, what are you upset about that we've released tritium into the sole source aquifer that Long Island's residents depend on for their potable water? There's tritium in exit signs. And they're right. There is tritium in exit signs. But that begs the argument. They shouldn't be tritium. Right? There's radioactive stuff in exit signs. What, what's going to happen after a number of years, an exit sign with tritium on it, uh, they, they, they use it for illumination, is thrown into a dump or is uh, right. uh, 
somehow thrown away. Uh, they shouldn't be tritium in exit signs, and certainly they shouldn't be tritium in our drinking water. But these scientists, uh, they're so into their own vested interest, so into, and I, I've explained where it comes from, the roots of it, that they, uh, like the tobacco industry, but even more so, lie, lie, lie. Well, it's also not just the nuclear industry also. This is another, when I was speaking with his health businesses, his, his, his position is that we're in a higher critical stage because of the uh, chemical contamination, which also is being ignored 100%. Well, and John if, 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 talked if, about that in Poison Power. He said, look, it's not just nuclear. It's all these technologies. They're out of control. Well, there's a synergistic effect, but I think that the health physicist you spoke to, like many so-called health physicists today. Is it, in fact, I, I do an interview with the, uh, you, can, you can get this on YouTube, with Dr. Carl Z. Morgan, and he was the first health physicist. He was hired uh, by the Manhattan Project to work at Oak Ridge National Laboratory during World War II, and he, he was the first health physicist looking to see the health impacts, the health consequences of nuclear technology. In my interview with Carl Z. Morgan, he, he talked about what's occurred to his, the profession he created, how what's now, they call themselves health physicists, but they're really, in Morgan's views, uh, to a large degree prostitutes of the nuclear establishment. They work for these national laboratories and others, uh, doing what he did, but instead of speaking the truth, as Carl Z. Morgan, who became a tremendous opponent of nuclear power plants, another another brave, honest person who stepped out of the nuclear establishment, Dr. Carl Z. Morgan. Instead of doing that, these health physics, and there's a health physics society. Uh, you can go to their, their website. It's amazing stuff, uh, which tries to minimize the health dangers of uh, of atomic energy, of, uh, of these nuclear poisons. And one of their arguments is that what, do you, what are you worried about in terms of uh, nuclear poisons? Uh, we got all these chemical poisons. Well, we have all these chemical poisons, and they shouldn't be either. That's why I've also, in my career as a journalist, particularly in my investigative reporting, focused on chemical pollution as well as uh, radioactive pollution. As I say, there is a synergy uh, the two of them, in fact, Rachel Carson gets into this in Silent Spring. Uh, there is a synergy between the two, making the two worse. But if you're going to compare nuclear poisons and chemical poisons, uh, it isn't that one is, well, it's, it, like I mentioned before, before we, we went on air, it's like comparing cancer and cholera. These are two terrible things. And in terms of we want to jump to chemical poisons, one of the things I've learned in doing this kind of work, investigative reporting on environmental and energy issues, and I've been doing this for 50 years, is that virtually all polluting processes and products are unnecessary. There is no need. I mean, I've outlined as to why there's no need for nuclear power. All these safe, clean, green energy technologies have come along. But likewise, in terms of, of chemical toxins, for example, um, uh, for many, many years, Monsanto was the sole producer of polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, uh, started in 1928, cancer-causing PCBs. And Monsanto knew, knew years ago how, how carcinogenic PCBs were. But then when there was an accident in Japan, this is in the 70s, oh. some PCB uh, liquid got into some rice oil and some Japanese people died, a thousand got terribly ill, and the Japanese moved to ban PCBs. And here in the United States, the EPA had just been created. We began to consider banning PCBs. Monsanto insisted, insisted that without PCBs as an insulating fluid, uh, like if you go along a railroad track, you'll see these big transformer boxes uh, they, for decades, had PCBs in them, or in a fluorescent light fixture, those little black boxes, the ballasts, PCBs in them. In any case, what Monsanto insisted is that without PCBs, 
industrial society really couldn't continue. In any case, EPA did thankfully ban PCBs. Has industrial society stopped? Not at all. And most interesting, uh, what's, what's been used as a substitute for polychlorinated biphenyls? Turns out mineral oil, not some space-age product that maybe wasn't around the 20s, the 30s, the 50s, the mineral oil. Uh, so, uh, again, other than to profit corporations and these big bureaucracies, uh, whether they be at Oak Ridge National Laboratory or Los Alamos or Brookhaven National Laboratory or at now essentially Japanese-owned uh, Westinghouse nuclear operation or, or Hitachi-owned uh, uh, GE and so forth, other than to profit uh, these entities – these poisons are absolutely unnecessary. As I say, what I've learned is virtually all polluting processes and products are unnecessary. And just let me note one other thing. I've been talking about accidents, talking about, um, oh, Three Mile Island or Chernobyl. Uh, and, and just let me insert here on Chernobyl, and I, I talk about this in the new edition of Cover Up, work done, led by Dr. Alexei Yablakov, who was She's, he's the racial Carson of Russia, and he's a good friend of mine, and I've been to Russia a number of times uh, at conferences that Dr. Yablakov has arranged, speaking out on, on, on toxic pollution, particularly nuclear uh, pollution. He and other European scientists in a book done about 10 years ago, uh, published by the New York Academy of Sciences, uh, looking at the available data as a, uh, looking at the, the health impacts wherever that Chernobyl fallout went. Uh, a lot of it went Russia, but a lot of it went Ukraine, and a lot of it went to Belarus, but some of it went to, well, Scandinavian countries and elsewhere. In any case, they calculate that 985,000 deaths have been so far caused by the Chernobyl catastrophe. In any case, we've had these disasters, Fukushima, Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, but you don't need a catastrophic accident for a nuclear power plant to cause to cause death. Uh, they mentioned before these discharges. Nu any nuclear power plant is constantly emitting nuclear poisons. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission regards this as allowable, right. uh, permissible, and so if you live around a nuclear power plant. Uh, you're faced with uh, with radio radiation radioactivity getting into your uh, your environment. Uh, a very important organization, and again, I'm on the board of this one, is the Radiation and Public Health Project. Just folks, Google Radiation and Public Health Project, and pull up some of the studies it's done on the cancer clusters around every nuclear power plant. Uh, in, in this country, it's 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 just absolutely outrageous it what has gone on, and it really has to stop. In your book, on page two eighty five, you have this map of the U S. I wonder what it looks like now. It was produced in nineteen seventy seven that shows where all the nuclear weapons uh, were, uh, design, testing, production, storage, deployment, underground experiments, university reactors, military and ERDA reactors nuclear power plants, nuclear industries, uranium mill tailings, transportation storage of radioactive materials and radioactive waste burial grounds. It is a shocking picture of our country. And this, when you talk about cover-up, this should have been on the picture of your book because this is the cover-up. <laughs> if people understood well, 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 what our country looked like, they would just be spitting nails like I am. And, and even people that are think that nuclear might be good, you know, we could find a decent way. Take a look at this picture. The scientific studies that nuclear causes catastrophic harm to human and all life, actually, is undeniable. It does cause harm. And to yes. look at this, and I can imagine, Carl, if we were to overlay all the chemical production areas on top of this map, we would clearly understand why our country has out of control cancer rates. The number one killer of children in our country now is cancer, not car accidents. Okay. That is an and, 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 
and in terms of, of, of adults as well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it. Yes. It, yes. Uh, we have a cancer I've written this piece. going um, on, and that is not going to stop. Just, just Google my name and cancer and causes, and you'll see how, and I, again, I've documented this rather fully, cancer yeah, was website, the number eight the killer. Way, we have about five minutes. I really encourage everybody to go to Carl's website and take a look. It's carlgrossman.com. It is actually chock full of great articles that he's written. The book is there. He has enviro videos that are completely fascinating presentations. This is a really uh, very comprehensive, if you really want to educate yourself on real information and not a biased view. I mean, you know, there's this is the kind of the argument like that I had with the guy, uh, what was it, the Natural Resource Defense Council. That's who called me up. Yeah. We were talking about this, about the difference between coal and nuclear. Well, it's it, it really is, we ought to all be on the same side. We're not on opposite sides. We just, you know, in order to get real information, we need to find an investigative reporter like Carl. We need like 100,000 of you, Carl, because we have to get the information out there, the real truth. People that will look at the scientific studies and question, did they exclude nuclear from their studies? Like, that group of, there were 13 scientists in California that were studying the uh, seals dying off in massive amounts on the West Coast. And at mm. their press conference, somebody asked them, well, did you look for radiation from Fukushima? They said, no, we specifically excluded radiation from our studies. With Fukushima yeah, yeah. going on for four years earlier, they're going to exclude radiation from their studies. That's yeah, and And... It, it's, uh, as I say, the Nuremberg principles should apply. The, the, these are cr crimes against humanity uh, being committed by, uh, well, people in government uh, and certainly people in industry. Uh, people. And the consequences are, well, oh, Einstein, he, he wrote a book at the end of the, 1946, after the war, out of my later years. And uh, he, he writes in the book, he wouldn't have lifted pen to paper and uh, signed that letter sent off to Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, we need conscience. Creating the Manhattan Pro, uh, causing the creation of the Manhattan Project. Uh, if he knew that the Germans weren't going to get the bomb, uh, and uh, well, they tried, but they didn't get uh, atomic weapons. And th then he goes on and um, out of my later years to speak about disaster, how humanity has often, uh, well, gotten involved in, on a very disastrous pathway. But with atomic energy, says, this is Einstein. Uh, this is beyond the scale of anything before. Uh, and, and it is. Um, and we must stop it. So, look, I need well, to interrupt we, you. I, I want to thank you, Carl, uh, joining, for joining us. This is Carl Grossman. Please go to his website. We have about 20 seconds left on the radio show. I hope you'll come back and join me again because this has been extremely informative, and I, I believe that you are a very powerful voice in this, in this movement. So I want to thank you, Carl, for joining me. Anytime, Lenny. Thank you, and I will call you up and book you again. Put your courage okay. on, everybody, and take action. You can matter, and please do take action.